Thank you so much, Kathy. It's a particular pleasure, as you might imagine, to have the hospitality of a distinguished center at the Graduate Center, the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, and to also have it with the friendship of a terrific scholar who has also been a friend for many years, and I owe Kathy a special debt uh, in her very generous invitation uh, to me to be a senior scholar at the center and uh, to bring my small uh, little organization with me. So thank you very much, Kathy. It's because of her that uh, I am here today and here this fall and winter and at the City University. I had sworn after I left Maryland, having left Rutgers, that I would not go back uh, to the university again, uh, but I'm very glad I broke that promise to myself and that I'm here. It's also a pleasure to be once again on the uh, podium with Francis Fox Piven. We met in the 70s when we were both regarded, even I was regarded then as a radical scholar. Uh, some might not think that anymore, but uh, I was back then, and Francis and I were asked by James McGregor Burns to be the co-chairs of the 1976 Bicentennial American Political Science Convention program. And we came up with a program that even I think uh, Jim Burns was a little alarmed by, but he generously in fact put into, uh, put into action. I've known Frances since then, uh, and she has remained a honest and authentic voice of progressivism and radicalism in America with a deep interest in those in whom the system has shown no interest, the poor and the homeless, and her work has been particularly about not how they can be helped, but the, how they find ways to help themselves through their movements and through the work uh, that they do. So it's a pleasure to have her perspective uh, this afternoon in responding uh, to to these comments. Uh, I'm also very pleased that Jackie Davis, the chairman of the executive committee of CivWorld, and uh, Rachel Cooper and David Bale, members of the executive committee, Leah Barber on the executive committee, and Harry Merritt are here today because that organization, the interdependence movement, which I'll only talk obliquely about today, is central to the thinking that has led me to this work on cities. And I hope that if you're not familiar with it, you will have a look uh, at interdependencemovement.org uh, online and get a sense of the work uh, that we are doing there. But let me make some remarks about uh, the city and suggest that it has changed in recent years my thinking about politics in ways that I hope it might also change yours. And in a sense, to just set what I want to do this afternoon is I, I want to change the subject. For 400 years, roughly, when we talk politics, we talk nations. We talk sovereignty. We talk the nation state. We talk about international relations, relations among nations. We talk about the League of Nations, the Concert of Nations, the United Nations. The nation state has been the central preoccupation, even obsession of politics for 400 years, and that's because it has been the central and pivotal and core institution of initially Western and ultimately global politics. There's no question that the primary actor in politics for the last 400 years has been the nation state. Its special role for the last 400 years has been as a guarantor and protector of democracy. And it's impossible to think about social contract theory, to think about representative representative institutions and to think about democracy without thinking about independent nation states inside of which democracy has nestled and its institutions has flourished. And the growth of the nation state and the growth of democracy over the last 400 years have more or less gone hand in hand. And democracy and all of us who care about democracy owe a tremendous debt to the nation state. But we know in the 21st century, democracy is in crisis, and I won't waste my time trying to persuade you of that, uh, since I think there are few people uh, who think any differently, not just here, uh, but in the Western world, and even in those parts of the world that are yearning for democracy and seeking it, we see whether Egypt or Libya or Syria or Afghanistan or Iraq or Somalia, we see how very difficult it is to secure democracy today in the context of the 
struggle for an independent state. In the 18th century, the Declaration of Independence spoke to the world by saying, if you want liberty, if you want freedom, if you want justice, you first must secure independence. And that has been the mantra of democratic-seeking peoples and the successful one for a long time. I want to suggest, though, that the crisis of democracy today is in part because that is no longer true, that nation states can no longer vouchsafe the security and liberty of citizens, that democracy is no longer well cared for in the nation state, that the nation state, so powerful and valuable for 400 years, has been outrun by the new circumstances of a global interdependent world in which the nation state no longer can solve problems, protect democracy as it once did. The mantra of the nation state is independence, sovereign independence, the independent jurisdiction, national borders, territories, frontiers. And the wars of states have been about frontiers, about borders, and about boundaries. The trouble is in the 21st century, and this actually happened almost 100 years ago with World War I and certainly after World War II, we live increasingly in a world not of interdependent challenges, uh, independent challenges, independent problems, but in a world of interdependent challenges. I won't enumerate them here, but if you look at sustainability, ecology, environmentalism, crime, disease, markets, drugs, technology, weapons of mass destruction, war, terrorism, every one of those threats pays little heed to boundaries. Every one of those threats is a cross-border challenge. Every one of those threats represents a new interdependence. To take just one example, Al-Qaeda. One of the reasons Al-Qaeda still lives, despite the fact that the leadership has li been liquidated, that drones are taking out its leaders along with a lot of other people who aren't its leaders or even in Al-Qaeda, but nonetheless the leadership is being liquidated. One of the reasons that Al-Qaeda survives is that it is what I would call a malevolent NGO. It's a non-governmental organization. It belongs to no state. And attacking states, laying low state governments, defeating the Taliban, defeating Iraq, making war, in Mali today, Somalia yesterday, Yemen tomorrow, will not stop it because terrorism, like sustainability, like markets, are interdependent in their character. So what we've created at the beginning of the 21st century is a deep asymmetry between the challenges we face and the political response, the political institutions we have to respond to that. Every challenge is interdependent, global, cross-frontier, and the primary political actors that respond are bounded, frontiered, independent nation states. And in that asymmetry, you can see the dysfunction of the modern world. We watch, for example, starting four or five years ago in Copenhagen and then going through Mexico City and Dubai and recent meetings where 180 or 90 nations came together to try to renew the Kyoto Protocol, already totally out of date in terms of the ecological challenges, but just to at least embrace that now antiquated document and failing to do so. And going home and saying that is because our sovereignty, says China, says the U.S., says now Canada, even leaders on Kyoto, doesn't permit us to monitor, doesn't permit us to report to international bodies, doesn't permit an international body to tell us what to do with emissions. Sovereignty has become the obstacle to cooperation, and it has increasingly, in the face of interdependent challenges, made states look more and more dysfunctional. How is it that the most powerful, well-equipped military nation the world has ever seen, the United States of America, can't bring a handful of terrorists to heal in Benghazi or in Mali or Afghanistan? The asymmetry between a massive military based on big ships, big planes, big bombs, and the reality of everyday guerrillas who blend